Thanks very much for the kind introduction. To mention me in the same sentence as Murray Rothbard is an honor. He is my teacher, my guru. I miss him really. Whenever there are problems I can't solve, I think of him. I wish he were around to help me more. Uh, Billy has suggested that I go over sections six and seven, six and eight in this book, which is the curmudgeon, the slumlord, the ghetto merchant, speculator, importer, middleman, profiteer, and fat capitalist pig employer. Uh, I don't know that I'll get through all of this, and I'm very flexible if uh, I understand uh, in South America they have revolutions all the time, so if you want to have a rebellion against me and say, no, no, this is silly, we don't want to talk about that, you want to talk about something else, that's okay. I figure I'd go for about a half hour, and then we could have questions and discussion, which is maybe even better than, than speeches. Uh, this book, Defending the Undefendable, is in my attempt to understand libertarianism. What libertarianism is, in a nutshell, is the non-aggression principle. You can do anything you want, just keep your hands off of other people and their property without their permission. <coughs> and what this uh, book lists is a bunch of people who are compatible with libertarianism, and yet either they're prohibited by law or the culture is against them, uh, but for whatever reason they are uh, downtrodden and I'm trying to defend them. So I call it defending the undefendable, uh, the indefensible, that is groups that most people won't defend, only a libertarian would. So the first one is the curmudgeon, the holdout, uh, the property developer wants to develop <coughs> a city block to build a house, but there's somebody that owns the house right here. <coughs> he won't sell it to them. So in a free society, the U.S. is a semi-free society, you'll have a, a block like this with one little bit and that's, this is just a little house there and the rest is a gigantic uh, something. Whereas in the Soviet Union, you wouldn't have that. You would just get rid of them because there's no private property. <coughs> this might be inefficient. Look what I got for you. <laughs> Thank you. This might be inefficient from an architectural point of view, but from a, a freedom point of view, it is efficient because there's no way to prove that it would be better to have the whole block square than to have this little bit cut out. Namely, the, the people who developed this land made him an offer, and they didn't offer him enough money. Maybe he had a sentimental value, or for whatever reason. Now, there is a problem when you talk about private roads, which is another book of mine. I wrote a book, All the Highways Should Be Private, mainly because in the US, 40,000 people a year die on the roads. And my claim is that it's not because of speed or drunken driving, it's because of government. Government can't manage the roads <coughs> properly. So how do you have private roads? <coughs> if I want to build a road from, well, I guess this is Buenos Aires, and uh, maybe this is Rio de Janeiro, and I want to build a road from one place to another, how many people must own property? 100,000? Between there, I don't know, a million? Who knows? A lot of people. And uh, maybe there's somebody right here. Do you people get um, South Park? Yes. 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 Uh, my favorite hero in South Park is the fat kid. What's his name? Cartman. 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 <laughs> so here you have Cartman. He says, Son of a bitch, <laughs> you can't build on my road, or you, you can't build a road to my property. Okay, so you can maybe build a road this way or that way, or maybe this way or that way. But suppose Cartman owns that land, and he says you can't build a road, pretty much. Well, in my work on this, what I say, there is this thing called ad colon. And the ad colon doctrine says that if you own 
a square mile on the surface of the Earth. You own down into the center of the Earth in a decreasing cone, and you also own up into the heavens, which means any time an airplane flies over your land, you can charge them, or you can prevent people from flying airplanes. Or any time, you know what slant drilling is? Like you have two bits of property, A and B, and this guy goes down and then gets the oil or the minerals under his property. That, that would be slant drilling. So according to the Ad Colum Doctrine, you can't, you can't do that because this guy owns the uh, material under his land. Is my English okay? Yes. Yes. You're understanding what I'm saying? But the Ad Colum Doctrine is wrong from the libertarian point of view because from the libertarian point of view, the way you get to own property is through homesteading. And this guy didn't homestead 30,000 feet above the airplane, and he didn't homestead all the way to the center of the earth. So what you can do with Cartman is dig a tunnel under him or a bridge over him. And in that way, you don't need expropriation or eminent domain, which is the, the government will take over take over property that it wants to. And what I'm saying is you can have free enterprise and private roads. Okay, so that's the curmudgeon chapter. And the next one is the slum lord. And here what I do is I criticize rent control. Rent control, I understand from Billy, used to be in existence in Buenos Aires, but is no longer in existence. And if you have a supply and a demand curve, There's the quantity of housing, and here is rent. Rent control means that the rent will be below what it would otherwise be where supply and demand equal, right? And what this does is it discourages investment in rental housing. It uh, takes away the incentive of the landlord to maintain the building. And it takes away the money that he could use to maintain the building. Rent control is such a bad idea if you want to have low rents for the poor and you want to use price controls. What you should do is the opposite of rent control, namely have a price control on everything else except residential rental units. And then the money will come flowing into residential rental units. Now, I'm not advocating that. As a free enterpriser, I certainly don't advocate massive price controls over everything except rental units, but I'm just saying, uh, trying to make a dramatic uh, way of saying that rent control is so bad that if you want to help the people with price controls, control everything else. So bad is rent control. Okay, the next uh, chapter is the ghetto merchant. Now in English, Ghetto it means uh, mainly a poor area where blacks live, the poor blacks in the United States. I'm sorry, I, I'm not uh, knowledgeable about the Argentinian situation. My main knowledge is from the US, so I have to use that as an example. Ayn Rand, one of my favorite heroes, you've read her book, Atlas Shrug? <laughs> she says, Ghetto came from Germany with Jews, and Jews were not allowed to live outside the ghetto. If a Jew moved outside of the area for Jews, go to jail or a concentration camp. But blacks are allowed to move anywhere. So it's not a proper word to call it ghetto, even though this is in common parlance, this is the way people refer to it, but it's strictly speaking not true. And so I call it inner city or black areas. So the question is, why is it that grocery prices are much higher in the inner cities or in the black areas? And the reason is there's more crime. And when there's more crime, you have to spend extra amount of money for private police. You can't put displays out on the sidewalk. 
Because if you do, the, the merchandise walks away <laughs> and nobody pays for it. So, of course, the prices are higher there. But are the profits higher? Profits tend to equal. If the, if the profits were higher in the rich areas, people would leave the inner cities and go to the rich areas. If the profits were higher in the rich areas, they would go to the poor areas. So profits tend to equalize, but the reason prices are higher in the poor areas is because costs are higher, and the reason costs are higher is because of the crime. So it's not true that the capitalist is exploiting the poor and making more profits off of him. He's not. Profits tend to equalize. In uh, New Orleans, uh, they had a Walmart. Do you have Walmarts here? Yes. yes. Walmart hate, hated of the left. The, the socialists hate Walmart. <laughs> because they're not unionized. They, they, if they're compelled to be unionized, they close down. There was a case in Quebec, Canada, where they opened up and then they unionized and they just closed down. No unions. Good. Unions aren't my favorite institution. <clears throat> because unions violate the non-aggression principle of libertarianism. See, if what a union did was just have a mass quit, that would be okay. Because if you can't quit, you're a slave. I mean, the only trouble with slavery is you couldn't quit. Otherwise, slavery was okay. You pick cotton, you could sing a song. <laughs> Not so bad. But you couldn't quit. That was the big problem. So if an individual can quit, a, a group can quit. You don't lose your rights just because someone else is uh, using their rights. So if a union limited itself to a mass quit, unions would be fine, but they don't. In addition to that, what they do is they say no one else can take their jobs. And they'll beat up scabs, they call them scabs, competing workers. So this is a violation of the principle. So anyway, Walmart is a wonderful group, but the left hates Walmart. And yet they opened up a Walmart in New Orleans, and white people and black people go there, and most of the employees are black. So you'd think they would favor Walmart, but they don't because they have their own agenda. Okay, the next one is the speculator. What's going on with the speculator? Speculators are hated and reviled and uh, denigrated and people hate the speculator. The speculator is evil and responsible for all sorts of bad things. So let me illustrate the speculator with the biblical story from the Bible of the seven fat years and then the seven lean years from the Bible. Everyone's familiar with that? So how do we illustrate the seven fat years? Well, here's time and here's quantity. Well, fat years means there's a lot of quantity, crops are good, and lean years means very little, right? So during the fat years, there's a lot of food, uh, meat, uh, wheat, corn, and during the lean years, very little. And as we know from supply and demand, fat years must mean more supply. Lean years must mean less supply, and people's stomachs are the same, whether the crops are good or bad, so we'll leave the demand curve where it is. So what the prices look like, well, during the fat years, prices are low. Price F for fat, fat price. <laughs> and this is a lean price. So the fat prices are low and the lean prices are high. Notice this is not a supply and demand. Here you have price and quantity. Here we have quantity versus time and price versus time. Time series it's called. Okay. So, what does the speculator do? Well, what the speculator does, if he wants to make money, I'll give you the secret. Buy low, sell high. Right? That's what the speculator does. He buys when prices are low, and he sells when prices are high. So he buys, 
if this is the supply and demand with no speculation, how do we illustrate what the speculator does during the lean years? Well, he's buying. So one of the curves must shift. It's the demand curve because he's now adding his demand for wheat or meat to the ordinary demand for eating. He now has a speculative demand. So let's say this is his speculative demand. And this is the demand for eating. So this is the total demand. Right? So what does he do to prices? He raises prices. So prices are a little higher than they otherwise would be but for the speculator. And what does he do to the quantity of the food that he buys? He sticks it in a, in a, a, a barn or in a, a silo. Or, namely, now there's less food for people to eat. Because he's taking food away from their eating and he's putting it in a barn. So we now have less quantity during the fat years for people to eat. Now come the lean years, and in the lean years, prices are high because there's hardly any food around. And what does he do during the lean years when prices are high? He sells. So if we have supply and demand here, and there is the supply and there's the demand, what he does now is he adds to the supply for people to eat. Namely, he takes the food out of the barn and gives it to people to eat. So what he does is he lowers the price and raises the amount of food available for people. Sounds good. Yeah. Namely, what he's doing is he's um, reducing oscillations. Oscillations is like this. And after like here's oscillations, wild oscillations, and after the speculator, it's uh, less oscillations. Now, if it was perfect speculation, it would be flat. But nobody's perfect. But he irons out the prices. He reduces the oscillations. And for this, he's reviled. Now, suppose he made a mistake. Suppose he bought high and sold low like the government does. <laughs> he would raise the oscillations, but what would happen to a guy who buys high and sells low? Broke. Goes, goes broke. So the remaining speculators are ones who are weeded out by the market process of speculation and they disappear. And the ones who remain reduce oscillations. So the speculator is a hero, yeah. not a person to be reviled. But People see, during the, the lean years, they see him selling at high prices, and they say, he's taking advantage of the poor. No, not taking advantage of the poor. He's reducing the price from where it otherwise would have been, and he's increasing the amount of food, thus saving lives. So the people who criticize him, is it hot in here? Hot. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not the hot air coming from the front of the room. <laughs> uh, I don't. Can we, we open a window or? <laughs> okay. So much for the speculator. The next one is the importer. What's going on with the importer? We're now talking about free trade, and the importer, or the smuggler, is an importer who imports illegally, is a, another hero, even though he is hated and reviled by, by the New York Times, <laughs> which is my criteria of everything that's bad. So there, there's a, a thing called absolute advantage and comparative advantage. Absolute advantage might be uh, Argentina is good at uh, making uh, wheat, and France is good at making wine, and each one is better than the other at doing certain things, and they trade, and then each one is richer. 
because in France they can make wine with a lot less labor and here we can make mead or wheat with a lot less labor than in France so we trade and both are better. Trade necessarily benefits both parties. If we trade my tie for your pen, it must mean that you value my tie more than your pen and you gain the difference to you between the values of these and I value your pen more than this tie so I also gain. So trade is not exploitative, trade is mutually beneficial. Now it might mean that the reason you're wanting this tie is you think I'll give you an A in the course. But I'm not a teacher, I'm not a professor here. So your reasoning is all wrong. So I don't say that your reasoning is correct. All I say is that for some reason you value this time more than the pen. And you gain. And I gain the other way. Okay, absolute advantage. Most people, even the lefties, they'll allow in the United States the importation of bananas. You can't produce bananas in the US. You produce them in Costa Rica. The very few people say we shouldn't import bananas, we should put bananas in hot houses. <laughs> and very few people in Costa Rica say we shouldn't import maple syrup from Canada. We should put big maple trees in refrigerators, <laughs> which would be a very expensive way of making maple syrup. They don't do that. They're reasonable for lefties. But where, where they mistake is a thing called comparative advantage. And comparative advantage, one country is better than the other country in both things. And some people think, well, that the country that is worse in both things will have vast unemployment. Not true, not true. The example I would offer you is here we have a lawyer, and here we have a typist. And the lawyer, let's say, if he practices law, can make $1,000 a day. And the typist can make 200 a day. And if the lawyer does not trade with the typist, let's say he can type better than the typist. He's a good typist as well. If he does not trade, and he has to pay, and he has to type, he makes a total of 1,200 for two days. In other words, every day he works as a lawyer, he has to then spend the day typing. <coughs> Another one? <laughs> Here we go. We change one. Oh, the comments. <laughs> so this is no trade. So how does the trade situation work out? Well, the trade situation works out. He works two days as a lawyer. He makes 2000 Then he has to pay a typist 200 a day or 400 And now he has 1600 So he's better off trading even though he can do his own typing. Right? Uh, Billy, say, can mow his lawn better than any lawnmower. But he can make more money doing what he does rather than lawns. So even though he's better than the lawnmower at lawnmowing, it still pays him to hire a lawnmower. So that would be the comparative advantage. And it's very hard to convince people of this. We have this uh, NAFTA, North American Free Trade Association. We have CAFTA, which is a Latin American, South American free trade zone. The libertarian answer is a unilateral declaration of free trade with everyone. It's like there are two men in a rowboat, and one guy shoots a hole in the rowboat. He puts up a tariff. Does it pay the other guy to shoot another hole in the rowboat? No. So even if someone is foolish enough to say, I don't want to trade with you on this, it's silly for you to exacerbate make the situation worse by saying, well, if you don't want to trade with me, then I don't want to trade with you. The proper answer is, well, if you don't want to trade with me, you're acting immorally and inefficiently, but I'm not going to do that. Hong Kong had this policy, free trade with every country, and Hong Kong in the 50s was a rock, empty rock with nothing, and now 
buildings, richness, wealth. So free trade is the way to, to grow. I understand from Billy that um, Argentina will not allow people to export wheat or meat. Silly. I mean, absolutely silly. Okay, the next one is the profiteer. The profiteer is someone who makes a lot of profit. And somehow this is bad. <laughs> well, profit is good. <laughs> Better than losses. Why, why don't they, they have profiteer and they hate the profiteer. Why don't they have the wage ear? Somebody who makes too high wages, they don't have that. I don't know why, but maybe they should. No, they shouldn't, because anything that's voluntary would be favored by the libertarian. My view is that the reason that private enterprise is much more efficient than the government is because of profits, profits and loss. Imagine if the government ran all the restaurants, no McDonald's, no nothing like that, just government restaurants. If they were bad, they would never go broke. Like the post office never goes broke, no matter how inefficient it is. Whereas if McDonald's gives bad hamburgers, we'll go to Wendy's or uh, Burger King or pizza or something else. That's why McDonald's is pretty good, because they have competition, because they're trying to make a profit. So my motto is that if it moves, privatize it. If it doesn't move, privatize it. <laughs> Since everything either moves or doesn't move, privatize everything. That would be the libertarian uh, ethos or the libertarian philosophy. The last one I want to do is the minimum wage law. And what's going on with the minimum wage law? The minimum wage law is seen by some people as a benevolent thing. What they want to do is wait, raise the wages of the poor. I was talking with this young lady before we started, and she said there are a lot of poor people. Well, one reason there are poor people is because they earn low wages. So it seems benevolent to pass a law saying wages have to rise. And the way people see it, they see minimum wage law as a floor under wages, if you put the floor here, wages can't be go below this, so raise it a little, and now wages can't go below that. Keep raising it, and we'll cure poverty. No. <laughs> the minimum wages are not, minimum wage is not a floor. Rather, the minimum wage law is a barrier over which you have to jump in order to get a job. And if you raise it too high, no one can get a job. Look, suppose we had a minimum wage law of $100 an hour. Very few people would, could get any job because they're not worth $100 an hour. Rather, wa wages are dependent upon productivity. And to be technical, there is a thing called marginal revenue product. Marginal revenue product. What is marginal revenue product? If you have, uh, let's say, 100 workers, amount of labor, and they produce $10,000 worth of stuff, and now you hire an extra worker, one more worker, and all of a sudden, the marginal revenue, the total product, total product in money, goes up to 10,005. We say that the marginal revenue product for this guy is five. Assuming all the workers are uh, head of homogeneous, all the workers are the same. You add one, one more worker. The only thing that's changed is you have this extra worker, and now the total goes up by five bucks. We attribute five bucks productivity to his efforts. So what would the wage be in the absence of a minimum wage law. Suppose I'm a worker and I have a little thing written on my forehead, a tattoo, five dollars an hour. That's my marginal revenue product. And you're a bunch of capitalist pigs. <laughs> like, like, who's going to open the bidding? How much are you going to offer me? Who's going to... How much? Five. 
Wow. No, you're, you're, you're not a fat capitalist pig. You have, to, you have to exploit me. Now, somebody said one dollar? No. That's not exploited. You have to grind me down into the dust. A dime is a little high. The right, the right answer is minus infinity. <laughs> Namely, I should pay you an infinite amount of money for the privilege of working in your factory. That's the true capitalist pig. But if we limit ourselves to positive numbers, a penny is the opening bid. Now, if somebody hires me for a penny, and my marginal revenue, uh, the profit equals marginal revenue product minus wage. And if the wage is one penny, and the marginal revenue product is five dollars. Well, then the profit will be four ninety nine, right? So somebody opened up the bid at a penny. What is the next capitalist pig going to say? Two cents. Two cents. See, first the capitalist pig will applaud the first capitalist pig because he's exploiting workers. This is good. But then he says, "I'd rather exploit the worker." even though I'll only make 498 rather than the other guy exploit him for 499 so I favor 499 philosophically as a principle but you know business is business 498 so the wage goes up to 2 cents then it goes up to 3 cents where does it end it ends with 5 so the person who said 5 in equilibrium, which we never reach, but in equilibrium, the wage tends to equal marginal revenue product. Because there are only three choices. Wage can be greater than marginal revenue product. Wages can be less than marginal revenue product. Or wages can equal marginal revenue product. And if marginal revenue product equals $5 in all cases, if the wage is, say, $7 an hour, and the marginal revenue product is five, what happens to profits? Minus $2, and you can't run a railroad that way. On the other hand, if the wage is, somebody said, um, four, someone else will offer 401. Right? So it's an unstable, so both of these are unstable, sorry, both of these are unstable. This is the only one that, that can be in equilibrium. So if you have a minimum wage of seven, he'll be unemployed. No one will hire him. Okay, I've now gone about a half hour. And I said I'd stop and have questions and discussion. So let me do that. <laughs> so who has a question or an argument or a different subject or? Yes. I, I, I didn't I use but it's very bad. Problem. It's I better, didn't better than my Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> I hear really good, uh, but I read. Uh, <laughs> but by reading the topics, more or less, uh, one can uh, predict, predict some uh, talking, uh, something about what is going to be uh, the text. But uh, the black mailer was when I read the black mailer, I can imagine something to say this is good because. Okay, uh, so the question is what about the black mailer? That's one of the chapters. And I do distinguish between blackmail and extortion. Uh, first of all, I don't say blackmail is good. <laughs> what I say is that it should be legal because it doesn't violate the non-aggression principle, so it should be legal. And since everybody hates it, they're heroic for pursuing it. Look, right now it's legal to wear a red tie. Not heroic. But suppose they pass the law, no red ties. Then it would be heroic to wear a red tie. Then I could defend red tie wearers. But now I can't. Okay, so what's the difference between blackmail and extortion? In both cases, 
In both cases, there's a threat and a demand. The usual demand is for money, but it could be for sexual services or anything. But there's a difference between, in the case of blackmail, the threat is to tell a secret. In the case of extortion, the threat is to violate the non-aggression principle. So, you don't know this, but Billy takes a bath with a rubber ducky. <laughs> and I know this. And I blackmail him. He sends me 100 a week. So I wouldn't tell anybody. <laughs> Do I have a right to tell people that he takes a bath with a rubber ducky? Yes, it's gossip. Do we put people in jail for gossiping? No. If we put people in jail for gossiping, we'd have nothing to talk about. <laughs> right? So all I'm threatening to do is to be a gossip. See, Billy is lucky he's got me as a blackmailer because if I were a gossip, his secret would be out. This way I have the decency to come in and say, look, give me money, give me money and I'll keep your secret. So I'm, I'm better than a gossip. And a gossip, he's, he's in trouble. With a blackmailer, if he regards the secret as worth more than the hundred bucks, he gains the profit of the difference between the secret and the hundred bucks. So blackmail is just threatening to do what you have a right to do. Whereas extortion is threatening to do something you don't have a right to do. Now if I were extorting Billy, I'd say, I'll kill your child if you don't give me money. I have no right to kill this child. I have no right to threaten to kill this child. So extortion is bad. It's illegal and I certainly don't defend that. I don't defend murder. I don't defend rape. I don't defend theft. I only defend things that are compatible with the non-aggression principle. Yes? Um, you mentioned Engram and I have a question about that. Um, so, uh, about the government. So, Engram was for laissez fair capitalism. Uh, still, she believed in some kind of limited government to protect property rights. I would like to know what do you think about that, and if you would be, if you would totally agree with her, or maybe she wouldn't agree with you. Well, I have a soft spot in my heart for Ayn Rand <laughs> because she was the one with Nathaniel Brandon, her chief lieutenant, who converted me to libertarianism. What happened is I was a student at Brooklyn College, and I was. Uh, pinko commie Jew from Brooklyn, which means I was a socialist, because everyone else was a socialist, so why shouldn't I be? And she came to Brooklyn College to lecture, and I came to boo and hiss her, because she was with economic freedom and capitalism, which, as we know, would lead to babies starving in the streets and misery and poverty. So at the end of the lecture, I hadn't had enough booing and hissing at her, and they announced that there was a, a, a luncheon in her honor, and anyone could come, even if you disagreed. And there was this long table, maybe 50 people on a side, and she was sitting at the head, and Nathaniel Brandon was sitting on one side, and I think, um, who was the head of the Fed? Greenspan was sitting on the other side. This is before he came, became the head of the Fed. <laughs> and all of her other lieutenants were sitting there, and I, I was relegated to the other end of the table, and I turned to my neighbor and said, where's this capitalist? It's all wrong. He said, well, I don't really know, but the people that do are over there. So I went and I put my head between Ayn Rand and Nathan and Nathaniel Brand. I said, there's a socialist here who wants to debate someone on socialism and capitalism. And I said, who is it? I said, me. <laughs> I was like 22 then, but I was, uh, it's called a chutzpahnik. <laughs> pushy. <laughs> pushy. <laughs> and Brandon was very kind very generous, said, yes, I'll come to the other end of the table and I'll talk to you if you make two promises. One, you'll not allow the conversation to lapse until we figure it out, until we get to the bottom of this. And two, you'll read two books that I recommend. One is Atlas Shrugged, and the other is Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt, mm -hmm. after which this book is sort of modeled. Hazlitt had one lesson, 
broken window lesson, look at all the, uh, uh, and then you have 35 illustrations. Well, I have one lesson here, the non-aggression principle and 35 illustrations. So this is sort of my homage to Henry Hazlitt. So I have a soft spot for Ayn Rand. Uh, what happened is I went to her seminars the Nathaniel Brandon Institute, but it was very cultish. You could ask the question of her like, well, on page 432 of Atlas Shrug, you say this, could you elaborate on that? <laughs> but if you said, well, on page 432 you said this, and on page 703 you said that, and there's a contradiction, you get kicked out. <laughs> what? I mean, that's no, that's, that wasn't kosher. <laughs> so, but I didn't know anyone else who favored free enterprise, so I'd sort of go and then I uh, approach avoidance. And then finally I met Murray Rothbard, and then I didn't go there anymore. So I regarded that sort of a cult. But that's my way of introduction. I'm a professor. I'm never allowed to answer a question directly. <laughs> so I had to go around. <laughs> now I'll answer your question. Uh, there are three types of libertarians. There's all of whom supposedly go along with the non-aggression principle. One is the anarcho-capitalist, like Rothbard. The other is the limited government libertarian, like Rand. And the third is the classical liberal, like Friedman, or Hayek. You're familiar with all these people? Jesus. Well, what, what they all three have in common, supposedly, is adherence to the non-aggression principle, that no one should initiate violence against anyone else. This group, I think, is the only one that's consistent with that. These two are not. What Rand says is that there's only one proper function of government, and that is protection of person and property. And there are only three institutions that are legitimate. Armies, to keep foreign bad guys off of us. Not to go and be an imperialist country like the US fighting in Libya. I mean, what do the Libyans have to do to us? Uh, police, to keep local bad guys off of us. Not to put people in jail for using drugs or prostitution because using drugs and prostitution are not a violation of the non-aggression principle. And three courts to determine who the good guys and the bad guys are. So that's this position. The next position, Friedman and Hayek add a whole bunch of other things, like Friedman believes in the Fed, believes in the negative income tax, believes in school vouchers as opposed to just private schools. Hayek makes all sorts of compromises in his uh, road to serfdom. They're a little bit better than Obama. <laughs> okay, a lot better. <laughs> I would call them libertarians, but they're second cousins. <laughs> These guys are first cousins, but this is the true, true stuff. Why? Because it upholds the non-aggression principle. Why does government per se violate the non-aggression principle? for two reasons. One is taxes. Well, taxes are coercive payments. They come with you, come at you with a gun and they say, pay or we'll put you in jail. It's true, the first the letter you get from the IRS, the US Revenue Agency, a very polite letter. <laughs> Have you forgotten it's April 15th? You didn't uh, file a return? You know, it's not okay, I'm sorry? Not the case down here, the first letter is not polite. Oh, well, the US is very polite, first letter. Second, a little less polite. Third, uh, a week later, or a month later, or whatever, is very less polite, and then some guy with a badge and a blue uniform and a gun comes and puts you in jail. And if you object, they shoot you. This is not the non-aggression principle, this is coercion. The second problem with government is that it demands a monopoly of force in a geographical area. It allows private police, but the private police have to be subservient. So how is that compatible? Now, the argument is that, um, what's your name? Benjamin. Benjamin? Gustavo. Gustavo and Benjamin will fight if we have anarchy. 
And we have to have a government to make sure Benjamin and Gustavo don't fight with each other. But private police can do that. Uh, private police have done that many years. There's been the uh, merchant, the uh, law of the merchant, uh, keeping track of people importing and exporting during the um, 15th and 16th centuries. If you really believe that Gustavo and Benjamin need a government because they'll beat up at each other's throats otherwise, well, do you know that the relationship of Argentina and uh, uh, Portugal is now a state of anarchy between the two of them? Namely, there's no world government? Forgetting about the US, which is trying to become the world government. The relationship between Canada and Bolivia is one of anarchism. So if you really believe in government, you should favor the world government if you want to be logical. The implication of local government is world government. And very few people are willing to have world government because then if there's democracy, China and India between them would sort of run everything. Yeah. People don't want that. So that's a better answer. That's the closer <coughs> to being responsible. Yes, sir. This is in relation with Ayn Rand as well. Um, what's your position regarding uh, IP? Is this the one on the Ayn Rand side or the one on the Wendy McCarroll or Kinsella, for example? IP is intellectual property. Stephen Kinsella mm -hmm. wrote this magnificent article in the Journal of Libertarian Studies. It won the award for the best article in the Journal of Libertarian Studies that year, and that converted me. Before that, I believed in the Rothbard view. The Rothbard view was that patents are okay, but, or rather, patents are bad, but copyright is okay. Why did Rothbard oppose patents? Well, suppose you and I are in our basement inventing the bicycle. And we're both working for five years inventing the bicycle. And you beat me to the patent office by five minutes. You get the monopoly rights over patents, uh, over the bicycle. I get nothing. According to Ayn Rand, even Ayn Rand would oppose this because she said that ideas are your property. Well, I invented the bicycle independently from you. Let's presume that that's true that I didn't look over your shoulder and look at the bicycle. I invented it in, uh, in New York and you invented it in Buenos Aires. We never met. So patents were rejected by Ayn Rand and Murray Rothbard because the independent inventor should get a right also. And patents give the right to the first guy in the patent office. Okay, then, but what about copyright? Now that's based on contract. I sell you this book, and I put a little C for copyright, and this means I sell it to you on the condition that you don't copy it and start selling it to other people. So this seems to be contractual and therefore legitimate. What Kinsella says is you can only own things that are scarce. You can't own things that are not scarce. And ideas, once they're out, are not scarce. E equals mc squared from Einstein. Once Einstein tells us anyone can use it and we don't take it away from Einstein. The first girl puts a hair up on a ponytail. The second girl says, oh, that's a good idea. I'll put my hair up in a ponytail. Did the second girl go to the first girl and, and take away her rubber band and mess up her hair and say, you can't wear a ponytail, only I can? No. All she did was put her hair up in a, with a rubber band. So she didn't stop the first girl from using the ponytail. So what Kinsella says is that ideas are not scarce. Anyone can use them without taking anything away from the first person to use them. So if I'm riding a bicycle, and you see me riding a bicycle, now let's say I sell you the bicycle on condition you don't copy it, but Gustavo, Dirty rat 
He sees you riding a bicycle and he starts having it. Well, I'm not contractually related to him. So copyrights aren't going to stop anything. So that's the they ontological or rights point. Now there's also the utilitarian point that Kinsella talks about. And he's countering the argument, well, if we didn't have pat pat patents, and we didn't have copyrights, there'd be no inventions. Because people couldn't capture the value of their inventions. You work five years, you make uh, the bicycle, you work three years, you make a book, and now somebody else copies it. What's the incentive to create music or uh, pharmaceuticals or computer programs or books or bicycles or anything? So this is a utilitarian question. And what Kinsella says is that it's a horse race. It's not clear that we'll have more or less inventions with or without copyrights. It all depends. On the one hand, yes, it's clear that if you have copyrights and patents, there will be an incentive for you to do R&D, research and development. On the other hand, the way research and development works right now, if I want to invent something, I can't just go and invent it. I have to go around all the extant pop, uh, patents. I'm spending half my time hiring lawyers and engineers to make sure that I don't infringe on other people's patents. And people are taking out patents, not with the idea of producing anything, but with the idea of preventing other people from inventing anything without paying them. So on, on the, you have it on the one hand and you have it on the other hand, and it's not uh, praxeologically clear, it's not logically clear which one you win. It's a horse race. And now Kinsella goes through all sorts of examples. For example, what's your name? Marine. Marine. Yeah. Suppose you, now you, you can, let's say you're a good publisher. You didn't write this book, but you're, and you can't say defending the unfaithful by no means because that would be fraud. But you can say defending the undefendable, written by Walter Block, as brought to you by Marine. And now you sell it at half the price, taking away all of my royalties, or most of my royalties. But on the other hand, what do you do to the demand curve for me as a speaker? You shift it to the right. Because you're so busy selling this book and making it cheap and selling it, and people read it and say, wow, Walter Block, i got to get him to give my next lecture, and now I can get more money. Or let's say music. I don't know who the bands are, the last rock and roll line. My favorites are Mozart, Bach, Handel, and Haydn. <laughs> <laughs> I used to like rock and roll. I like Elvis and the Beatles. That sort of dates me. I didn't like anything after that. <laughs> but suppose there's a new rock band, and it creates a song, and Gustavo, I'll pick on you, you copy it and sell it. On the one hand, you're reducing their royalties, but on the other hand, you're very busy promoting them. You're like a promoter for this rock band, and now more people want them to give a concert. When soft cover books first came out, this was when the hardcover, the only books were hardcover. I don't know, you people are too young for that, but when I was a kid, there were no soft cover books. There's somebody who's <laughs> supporting me on this. It was only hardcover books, and the hardcover book is 30 bucks. Soft cover book is $7. People said, well, that'll be the end of hardcover. But no, time is very important. The hardcover book comes out first, and the soft cover book will come out six months later, but you're anxious to read this, so you go buy it. The same thing with movies. It used to be you want to see a movie, you go to a movie theater and there's a big screen. And then came VCR, and the movie cost 12 bucks, and the VCR you can rent for $3, and you can bring 20 of your friends, you can all watch it, and everyone said there'll be no more movies. No. There's still movies. People want the experience of a big theater with all the people and the popcorn and all that. Right? Another example is um probably I, probably the internet gave much more offense to that. I, I mean probably the internet 
get much more sense to that. I mean, the scarcity is, I mean, non-existent. I mean, you can download a movie, yeah. and uh, it's and still perfect. Movie. Movie. So, I mean, there's no scarcity. Look, you can get this book for free. You don't have to buy it. You can get it for free on, on the Google it. You'll get it for free. Yet, people still buy it because, you know, they want the book. They can throw it at people. <laughs> uh, another example for you transvestites, <laughs> men who like to wear women's clothing, is Paris dresses. Paris dress is $50,000. And three months later, you can buy it in Macy's, the local department store, for 50 bucks. And yet, they still pay 50000 for the dress. So it's a, it's a horse race. And Kinsella says it's not clear, but there are many, many, many examples where time is very important. And the first producer, I now cure cancer. I have the solution for cancer. It's um, part cough drop and part chalk and part raisins. And I grind them up and it cures cancer. Only I know this. Now, you can reverse engineer this. You know what reverse engineering is? You, you take my pill and you get a chemist, but it'll take you a couple of months to do this. The Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola, uh, what do you call it, uh, formula, uh, has not yet been reverse engineered. So maybe you won't be able to reverse engineer my cancer cure. Maybe you will in six months. But meanwhile, I'm selling this thing for 100,000 a pill, and it works. People who had cancer don't have it. And now you come along six months later. I have plenty of incentive to invent it. And who's going to trust you? Come to me. You know it works. So will there be less incentive? Yes. But still, there'll be some incentive to invent cancer cures, and I'll win the Nobel Prize, and there are other reasons to invent things. So that's the IP. The libertarian answer is IP is illegitimate. You can't have property in ideas. Then, how does that not violate the non-aggression principle? For instance, if I don't want to nominate that, they invest a lot of money, I'm going to make a million dollars, they can move it. But then, maybe the day before it comes out, or the day after, there's a pirated version on the street. Does that not take what would have been rightfully mine? And, and See, if you ask, violate the non principle? If you ask this question, in the Nathaniel Brandon Institute, they say, get out. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not like that. Uh, OK, so I make this movie, XYZ movie. You're probably not going to be able to pirate it because I keep it to my chest. I keep it secret until it gets out in the movies. And now, a week later, you finally get the movie. right? But I've had it for a whole week. And the way movies are, in the first week, you can make 40, 50% of the total amount of money, uh, or a, a big proportion of it. So I have some incentive to do it. Now you pirate it and you start showing it, well, I'm more likely to win the Academy Award. Because more people are seeing it. My uh, demand curve for me as an actor increases, and me as a producer, and me as a director. In other words, you're like my literary agent. You're helping me. But the point is, did you steal anything from me? No, you didn't take a knife and slash my movie. You just copied it. You didn't stop me from showing it. I can still show it, so you didn't steal anything from me. You just copied it. Let me give you another example. You know, uh, when you make a log cabin, if you just make it with logs, you have to put mud and the logs fall apart. But if you put um, a little notch in, in the log, like this. So here's a log. And if you try to build a log cabin with logs like that, you have trouble. But if you make a little notch, Like this, and now you put the logs touching the notch. You know what I'm saying? It's much more solid. Okay, so this guy over here, what's your name? Eduardo. Eduardo makes notches on his logs, 
And your name is? Alfredo. Alfredo sees it. And now Alfredo can make a much better log cabin because he copies Eduardo. And Eduardo comes over with a, a flame and he starts burning his logs because he says, well, you, you stole my idea. But he didn't stop him. He can still use that secret for making a log cabin. He didn't take anything from him. He didn't stop him from building logs with the notches. He just copied it the same way as the second girl with the ponytail. So you're back on deontology rights. Aren't you stealing something? No, you're not stealing something. You're copying it. Stealing me, if you steal this pen, I don't have the pen anymore because the pen is scarce. But if you steal my idea, I still have my idea. So you didn't steal it. You just copied it. Does that make sense? Don't you take away the ability to profit from it? Don't you take away what? The ability to profit from it? I mean, you the take, and, and you take the resource for movie is, is you, nice. you take away some of the ability to profit from it, but I don't own the rights to profit from it. I only own the thing. And if nobody wants it, I can't make any profit from it. Can I sue people for not buying this? Yeah, I have no right to profit. Profit is a mutual thing. Well, all I have a right to is this, or this, physical, or this, right? But I don't have a right to the price of it. If you open up the bakery across the street from my bakery, you steal half my customers away. I don't own those customers. I don't own the profits. So it's an empirical question as to whether you really do reduce my profits or not, or my incentive to invent. Maybe yes, maybe no. Depends, and there's a whole bunch of evidence showing you don't. But that's a utilitarian question. The rights question, more of interest to libertarians, is are you stealing anything, and how can you steal it when I still have it? Just to make a couple of questions about two controversial issues the legalization of drugs and abortion. Abortion. <laughs> well, the drugs one is easy. <laughs> the drugs question is, and I don't favor the use of drugs. I wouldn't want my children to use heroin. It's putting poison in your body. You, you become dependent on it. So I don't favor it, but I favor the legalization. Same with prostitution. I have a daughter. I don't want her to be a prostitute. <laughs> but if she were a prostitute, I wouldn't want to go to jail for it. Right? So I don't want anyone here to use drugs or become a prostitute or any of that stuff. So I'm not favoring these actions. But when done between consenting adults, they don't violate the non-aggression principle. So therefore, to put someone in jail for putting poison in their body or having a physical, sexual relationship that isn't really nice, you shouldn't do that. That's a violation of libertarian principle. Ron Paul, candidate for president in the US, favors legalization of heroin and prostitution. He doesn't favor heroin and prostitution. He's very straight-laced, very conservative in his demeanor, as I am. But So we have to distinguish between use of and legalization of. Now, look at Mexico. What's happening in Mexico is that the armed drug gangs are fighting the government on roughly equal terms. Why? Because these drugs are very, very profitable. Why will the government never win the drug war? Because every time they win a battle, they lose the war. Suppose they win a battle and they interdict they grab a shipment of drugs and they burn it. What happens to the supply curve of drugs? Shifts to the left. What happens to the price and the profits? It rises. Look, uh, who is the heavyweight champion uh, Klitschko? Heavyweight champion boxer right now? Suppose I got in there with Klitschko and every time he hit me I fell to the earth and I got stronger. And every time I hit him, rarely, he, he got hurt. Well, I'm going to win. Because every time he punches me, I get stronger. How, how, can, how can he win? 
Eventually they'll get tired or bored or something, I don't know. <laughs> so they can never win the drug war. The drug war is responsible for a lot of deaths, just like the alcohol prohibition was responsible for a lot of deaths. Now we've legalized alcohol. I don't favor using alcohol, especially overusing it. <laughs> but during the prohibition, you had all sorts of problems. You had bathtub gin, namely impure drugs. One of my favorite heroes, Lenny Bruce. Anyone ever hear of Lenny Bruce? You know, he was sort of quasi-libertarian. He was one of the first nightclub actors to use the F word. He would use it in public and he would get arrested for that. And the police knew that he had a, a ship, he was a drug addict, and they knew that he had a bad shipment of heroin and they let him do it and he died. People die from this stuff, not from the drugs itself, but from impure. Whereas if it was done by, not fly-by-nights, by legitimate businesses, that, you know, you go to the pharmacy and you get your drugs, there wouldn't be these deaths. So the drugs is an easy one. Now for abortion. Abortion is tougher. Now there are three schools of thought on this. There's the pro-choice, pro-choice, pro-life, and there's what I call evictionism. Everyone's heard of these first two? Yes. Evictionism is based on the NAP, non-aggression principle, plus private property rights. So what's evictionism? Evictionism is that the mother owns her womb. And an unwanted baby is a trespass. Easy to envision this in the case of rape, where it's obvious trespass. But even if a woman has intercourse and doesn't want to have a baby, she looks upon the baby as somebody in her body. And therefore, does she have a right to kill it? Right to evict, right to kill. The pro-life people say no right to evict, no right to kill. The pro-choice people say yes, right to evict, and also right to kill. They have this thing called partial birth abortion. When the baby is eight months old, eight and a half months old, viable outside of the womb, and they go in and suck out the baby's brains, kill it. That's what, I'm not making this up, I mean, it's pretty disgusting, but they claim that you have not only the right to evict, but the right to kill. Because the woman now hates the man who impregnated her, whether he's a rapist or not, and she says, well, I'm not gonna bring that guy's baby into this earth, so we kill him. The, pro, the evictionism is you have a right to evict, but not to kill. So it's a true compromise. But it's not a compromise compromise. A compromise compromise is, I say two plus two is four, you say two plus two is six, we compromise, two plus two is five. <laughs> that would be a, a statistical <coughs> compromise. And this isn't that. It works out that it's a compromise, but it's a compromise based on libertarian principle. And the principle is the woman owns her body, and she had, look, suppose somebody trespassing on your lawn. You have a right to just shoot him? No. You say, sir, do you realize you're trespassing? In other words, you have to deal with criminals or trespassers in a generalist manner possible. <laughs> and if the guy says, well, sorry, I didn't realize it's yours, and he gets off, you have no right to kill him. You have a right to evict. Now, I happen to be a fan of pro life. I don't like these guys. I like these guys. But I notice who is winning right now. Who is win I don't know about what's true here, but in the US, the pro-choice people are winning. You can have an abortion at any time. See, an abortion, an abortion really is a two-stage thing. It's evict plus kill. That's what an abortion is. 
So I oppose the killing part. Now, 50 years ago or 100 years ago, evictionism, say 50 years ago, pro-choice and evictionism were the same. Namely, to evict was to kill. But 50 years from now, let's say in the year 2100, now pro-life and evictionism will be the same, right? See, right now you can evict without killing in the last trimester, eighth, seventh, eighth, and ninth month. But surely in 10 years as medical technology gets better, it'll go down to the sixth month. And then in another 20 years, the fifth month, Probably by the year 2100, take the fetus. By the way, I believe that human life starts with the fertilized egg. So I agree with the pro-life people on that. All right? Because a sperm alone will not develop, an egg alone will not develop, a sperm in an egg will develop in, a, in the right environment. So I believe human life starts right then and there. But by the year 2100, the fertilized egg can be put in a test tube or in a host mother or whatever with no harm. See, so one reason for all pro-life people to adopt evictionism is because it's right. Deontological. Another reason is utilitarian. Medical technology is on our side. If we all adopt evictionism right now, by the year 2100, there'll be no more killing of innocent babies. If we don't, the pro-life people will win. So there are two reasons for adopting evictionism. One, because it's the only view compatible with libertarianism, and the other because if you really favor live babies or, or oppose killing helpless human beings, you should adopt evictionism just as a ploy even if you don't agree with it. Billy, you have? Yeah, I have a question here. Uh, in the pro-choice, how do, you, how do you measure the aggression of, of uh, killing a baby with a, with, with a human being, which is uh, the fertilized egg? I mean, it's, it's just like uh, uh, you have an aggression against another being. I understand the, the argument that why should I support? But you were part of the decision if it wasn't rape. Well, let's take rape for a second. All babies have equal rights. The baby who is a product of rape is equally innocent to any other baby. Right. So, if you have a right to kill the product of rape, and most people favor that, most, not all, the only consistent position is you have no right to kill the baby, period. Certainly not in the case of rape. But if you agree that you can kill or abort the baby who is a product of rape, and it seems difficult to avoid that. I mean, here's a 15-year-old girl walking down the street. She gets grabbed up, and next thing she's got something growing in her. It seems a bit harsh to say she's got to keep it for nine months. But Another case is uh, another exception that even the most ardent pro-life people say is when it's a mother's uh, life is in danger, then it's okay. But why? Even that shouldn't be. Because here you have two human beings with equal rights. One is 30 years old. One is a day old or a month old. If anything, you should kill the mother because she's already had 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> right? So the pro-life position has got problems. Now, I agree with the idea that when the mother versus the baby, you pick the mother, but because it's the mother's property. The baby is in the mother. Now, the, one of the objections is, well, okay, I now invite you to come on my plane. Come on, have a nice little trip. Now we're at 30,000 feet, 
And I say, guess what? Yeah. <laughs> I'm tired of you. You're, yeah. getting, you're getting vocal. You're getting boring. <laughs> parachute? I don't have a parachute. <laughs> but I claim this, this analogy. By the way, I've been writing about this since about 1978. My first article was on 78. And I must have written 10 or 15 articles on that. And I don't mind writing, I, I'm, I've got 10 or 15 articles on minimum wage and on rent control. And people say, why do you keep writing about it? And I say, well, because the law is still there. As soon as they get rid of the law, stop writing about rent control and minimum wage. As soon as everyone adopts evictionism, I'll stop writing about it. But right now, the pro-choice people are in the ascendancy. So I keep writing about it. And I keep waiting for people to criticize me. And finally, there's this kid. I can't write his full name. It's W-I-S... Lewski, something like that. He's a Polish kid. Very bright kid. And he and I have about four or five articles attacking each other. Using articles like this plane business, you know, the airplane. And my claim is that this is this analogy. Um, I made you worse off by inviting you on the plane and then kicking you off. Whereas when I created you, I made you better off. Because before you were non-existent, and the Randians will say existence is better than non-existent, I gave you life for a week or a month or whatever. So this, that's this analogy. And uh, in the case of ordinary sexual intercourse, for many years people didn't realize where babies came from. They thought it was the stork. <coughs> You know, the big bird with the big beak, or they didn't know. So if you don't know, how can you be inviting? Right? Now, this is a very, very complicated issue. And I uh, suggest, if you're interested in it, you look, well, email me, and I'll give you all of my articles plus the Wisniewski articles. Here's my email address. And I'll send you all this stuff. It's a very complicated issue. By the way, I got into a debate with this guy named Roderick Long, who I respect greatly, because I wrote an article saying that Randy Barnett, a sensible libertarian, is no libertarian at all because he supported the US imperialism in Afghanistan and Iraq and everywhere. And Roderick writes back and says, well, you support Ron Paul. And Ron Paul is a pro-lifer. So why don't you say he's not a libertarian? And my answer is twofold. One, this is a very complicated mission. In a way that imperialism, US killing innocent people who've never attacked us is not a complicated mission. And secondly, Ron Paul is not an intellectual. He is just a doctor, just a politician. He's not a really an intellectual. Don't tell him that. Can't hear you. Don't tell him that. <laughs> well, he's quite right. He's made original contributions to the Fed and other, uh, other stuff like that. But see, the, the other issue is um, immigration, where I disagree with Ron Paul. And here you get Murray Rothbard and Hans Hoppe on the one hand, and you got a whole bunch of other libertarians saying the other. So my idea is that when a, polit when a politician airs on an issue where top libertarian intellectuals are debating, you've got to give them a buy. But there are no top libertarian intellectuals who are saying that the U.S. should bomb everyone that they don't like. So I disagree with Ron Paul on this issue, but I'm a big, wild supporter of this because you know, he's just magnificent. I mean, uh, there was this guy, uh, Doherty, who wrote a book. I forget his first name. And what he said is, who are the, the people who've created more libertarians than anyone else? And what he listed was Rand and uh, Rothbard, Mises, Hayek, and Frieden. Well, if I were writing that book, or maybe if Doherty were writing it now, he'd add Ron Paul. I mean, I had Ron Paul to my university, and <laughs> we had overflow crowds. He gives speeches in football stadiums to 20,000 people. It's unprecedented. He's put libertarianism on the map in a way 
that nobody has except maybe these people, uh, those five. So Ron Paul certainly deserves sixth place, in my view, even though we disagree. Well, you know, we're not a cult. We can disagree. We can disagree on IP. We can disagree on uh, one or two things. And Murray Rothbard used to say, every dog gets a few bites. <laughs> we, don't, we don't require absolute conformity on everything because the world is complicated and we're not as smart as we would like to be. We could all use an extra few IQ points. <laughs> the world is a complicated place. Uh, so I think libertarianism is a, a philosophy where we agree on most things, but not every last jot and tittle. We don't agree on everything, and that's, that's okay. Yes, sir. Uh, I'd, I'd like to pause it. I have about two more questions. Two more questions, okay. Uh, just a fact, the only movie you can get on the internet is Apple Shrug. It's like, <laughs> it's not there. I missed it. I was waiting for it to come to the theater. You would see it. I was dying to see it. Like that. That's funny. Well, I believe it's very bad and very good. <laughs> was that your question? No, no. The <laughs> question is, uh, how would a free market deal with resellers, for example, ticket resellers? Ah, I think I have a chapter in here on the ticket scalper, ticket yeah, scalper, same sort of a thing. Uh, the way I deal with that is I ask, why is it that the uh, rock band or the football team or whatever uh, charges a low price such that the scalper can charge a higher price? And the reason is because the stadium is fixed. You know, you have a hundred thousand seats, and that's it. And ordinarily, the demand curve is, I don't know, a hundred dollars a ticket. And now you have the Super Bowl, or you have the Second Coming of the Beatles, or something like that. And now the demand curve is over here at the. Uh, 5,000 a ticket. So why don't they just charge 5,000 a ticket? The reason they don't charge 5,000 a ticket is because they would be accused of profiteering or gouging or something bad. I remember, you know, I was in New Orleans when Katrina struck and prices of orange juice and milk and baby diapers and gasoline went through the roof. Now we know as economists that this is just a market signal calling for new supply. Right now, during Katrina, the only reason somebody would come from Wisconsin far away to bring stuff is out of benevolence. But at a high enough price, they'll come out of self-interest too. And yet, what was the attitude of the New Orleanians or the Louisian Louisianians? Was that this is gouging. There was even a case where people were online to get ice or gallons of water, and somebody on the line called the cops on his cell phone, and the cops came and shut it down, and everyone online applauded. That's almost like a contradiction in nature. On the one hand, let's say they were selling a bottle of water for 25 bucks. That showed that they're online, that they value the water more than 25 bucks. And yet, the guy online called the cops and shut it down. It's almost like a contradiction in nature. Okay, so the reason they don't charge 5000 is they'll be accused of God knows what. The antitrust people will get on their case. Monopoly, antitrust, profiteering. So they charge, maybe they'll charge a little bit more. And then you have scalping. And scalping brings the price up to where it should be. Scalping or is just reselling. Why can't we resell? I mean, we've established that any sale is mutually beneficial at any agreeable price. One last question. <clears throat> Who's up? Uh, about the abortion. Uh, can I uh, yeah, abortion? abortion. <clears throat> uh, what if we change killing with not feeding the baby? Choose. Because this.
That's a very, very good question. Suppose, and it's a really a vicious question. Get out. <laughs> very tough question. I've written about that also, and if I don't do justice to it, email me and I'll send you some stuff on this. Okay, so I have a baby and I don't want to take care of it, and I just leave it in the back room and I don't feed it, and in two or three days it's dead. What does the libertarian say about that? Well, I have this thing called bagel theory. That's for the Jews and donut theory for Christians. <laughs> what is this? Here's the bagel, or the donut. And it's got three levels. Now suppose somebody homesteads land like B. He homesteads the bagel land, leaving A, which is a square mile, untouched. Is he allowed to do that? I say no. I say what he's doing is uh, foreclosing. I have other words. I forget the other words I use to describe this. Namely, this is a contradiction because the idea of homesteading is to put every square inch of land into private property. And if you homestead in the B terrain, what you're doing is subtly, and not so subtly, controlling A, even though you haven't homesteaded it, namely, you're preventing other people from homesteading A. You can't do that. What you have to do if you want the B area is you have to have a little path so that other people can get in there and out of there. I have a friend who is a Hasidic rabbi, you know, the guys with the side curls, and he tells me that the Talmud says this also. It's interesting that the Talmud and the libertarian theory have parallels. Can't you have a uh, uh, drill under it? Or a bridge under it? You could. But in the era before bridges and tunnels, and libertarianism has to be timeless, you couldn't do that. The question is, can you control land that you haven't homesteaded? And the answer is no. You can only control land you have homesteaded, and you haven't homesteaded A, but you're controlling A, you're preventing, foreclosing other people from getting at A. Now let's get back to the baby, who I'm starving in the back room. Now the tradition was, if you don't want to take care of the baby, what you do is you bring it to an orphanage, or you bring it to the police, or you bring it to the hospital, or you put up a sign, something. You tell people, because if you don't, you're foreclosing. So you agree that For, oh, forestalling is another one I use. I'm sorry? So you agree that the government doesn't have the right to uh, make you feed the, the baby? You, you are free to... Yeah. First of all, don't curse. <laughs> Use the G word. <laughs> 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 okay, okay. Use government. Use government in a, in a non-negative way. I'm, I'm just. <laughs> it's late. I'm being silly. I'm time zone. Whatever. Um, what you're doing with this baby is you're forestalling or foreclosing other people who want to take care of the baby. You're preventing that. Now, the obvious objection is, well, what about positive obligations? For the libertarians, there are no positive obligations. There are only negative obligations. The only obligation you have as a libertarian is to keep your goddamn mitts off of other people and their property. What's this obligation to bring the baby to the orphanage or to the monastery or wherever you bring babies? Well, I say it's not a violation of the, notice how nimble I'm being here. <laughs> See, my idea is I don't like the idea of starving babies. And I sort of created this bagel as a way out of that. <laughs> because it seems to me that there are no positive obligations to allow A because it's a contradiction. Now, there are two interesting cases that came up here. One was a case in Canada where a man killed his 14-year-old daughter who was multiply handicapped in many, many different ways. 
and he was convicted in Canada of murder, what would the libertarian view be? The libertarian view would be he would post a notice saying, here's his daughter, but I don't want to maintain, does anyone else want to? And if no one else did, then he would kill her. Which is a little contradiction of the NAP, but um, tap dancing my way around here. The other was this case of, um, <laughs> in Florida, Terry Shiva. Terry Shiva. Sure, that's the way to spell it, but something like that. Terry Shivo was a woman of about 35 years old who was comatose and was on uh, life support. And the question was, should the plug be pulled? And the court decided that the her guardian was her husband, who had another lady friend who we wanted to marry, <laughs> but that's another issue. My idea is that for the guardian, you have to guard. Now, if the husband put a notice saying anyone else want to pay for this and nobody does, okay. But the parents wanted to keep her alive because who knows, a miracle might occur. So what the court should have done if they were libertarian, they should have said, aha, you want to pull the plug? You're no longer a guardian. Who's next? The parents. You don't want to pull the plug? Who's next? Siblings. Who's next? Friends of comatose people. There are groups of who will support you. So you keep going down the list. Now, if there's no one on this earth that wants to support her... And how about if the girl herself says, okay, pull the plug? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. How about if the girl herself says, pull the plug? Well, she was comatose, she, so she couldn't say anything. <laughs> how about? <What? laughs> what? There was no way for her to write or anything. No, she was unconscious. Right. She, was, she was like a baby. But if she had had uh, a will or a, a sign, um, what do you call it? Um, a lawyer signed it, or uh, she had a written statement: "DNR, do not resuscitate." Then I favor. There's another problem now in uh, where is it? The U.S. or Canada? Can you help people die? Can you aid and abet people who want to die who are physically unable to kill themselves? Well, yeah. I mean, if you agree, and. and and if the court approves of this, private court. <laughs> okay, well, that was the last question, so thanks for your attention.